Hello and welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm Colin Hung, and today I'm excited to sit down with Kevin Campbell, founder and CEO of DTA Healthcare Solutions. Kevin, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Colin. Now, Kevin, before we get started, maybe you can give our listeners and our viewers just a quick update uh, on what DTA Solutions does. Yeah. Yeah. So DTA Healthcare Solutions is a a consulting company. We've been around since 2012, uh, formerly known as DTA Associates. Some people might know us by that name, Um, but we've we've been consulting uh, exclusively in in healthcare around data and analytics and data governance uh, since 2012 and recently released uh, a data catalog solution called Compendium. Nice, nice. So obviously what we're going to be talking about today is, is data and uh, trying to wrap our arms around the tons of data that healthcare produces. And actually, that's going to be my first question for you, Kevin, is, you know, uh, RBC Capital Markets projects that by 2025, the compound annual growth rate of data for healthcare will reach 36%, which is much, much higher than most other industries, including manufacturing, financial services, and even media and entertainment. Uh, and in fact, in 2018, Statistica estimated healthcare was already producing 2,300 exabytes of data. And one exabyte, by the way, is a billion gigabytes. Um, does this track with the explosive growth that you're seeing in healthcare data? Yeah. I mean, first of all, you can't really see that data. I don't even know how to conceptualize that. I'm not sure anybody really can. It's It's staggering how large those numbers are. And and when you think about what that entails, you know, it's one thing to think about uh, data uh, volumes around, you know, streaming videos across the internet around the world every day. You know, you could, you could understand that and and in it, it's maybe there's nothing super concerning about it, but when you think that uh, it's actually about us, it's about healthcare, it's about the very intimate and personal details about, uh, about uh, people receiving care, it, it gives you pause along those, those lines as well. But yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, I, I believe it, even though I can't conceptualize it because it's, it's uh, data is just growing and, and growing like crazy. And you think about it, it's, you know, if you think about Best Buy selling a laptop, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of characteristics around a laptop, right? But there's, not that many when you compare it to the human body. <laughs> so, right. And as, as the science progresses, as treatments progress, uh, as new diseases are looked at, we delve deeper and deeper into, you know, the human body and into population health and things like that. And that comes along with it, larger and larger volumes of data. So that's, that's really what's, what's driving that, um, that growth. Yeah, you just, I mean, all you have to do is think about a typical visit, right? Like there's labs, there's doctor's notes, there's the medications that you've been prescribed. There's all the physical stuff around which bed you were in and what devices in your room. And, right. you know, and then that doesn't even get, get, it, get into the diagnosis, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. And, and so and you, you mentioned devices, you know, think about uh, obtaining that device data, right? So that's a lot of data. Um, and as, as systems can, can handle it, we're increasing the frequency with which we, we obtain that device data. Add all those devices together, you know, polling data on a more frequent basis. That's just another great example of just the growth explosively of data in healthcare. So I, I, I think I'm probably going to understate, make an understatement by saying, you know, this is a huge amount of data <laughs> that we're having to wrap our arms around in healthcare. So, so how do we tame it or can we tame this? What are some things that we can do as healthcare organizations to, to kind of, like I said, put our arms around all this data? Yeah, well, I think we can. Um, we have to recognize what we can tame and what we can't tame, at least in, in the short term. And I think a lot of times people get overwhelmed when they think about that volume of data or even just, I mean, you're talking about you know, data worldwide uh, even if we shrink down to um, a medium-sized uh, hospital system and the kinds of data that that they're uh, that they're accumulating, it's still huge volumes that we can't even really conceive of. And so that's overwhelming uh, to anybody who tries to tackle that. And so often people will try to boil the ocean, uh, and 
and do everything? How can we get all of this data under control at once? And so the first the first step is to recognize um, where to start and and you know what we can have an impact on. Uh, so that means you have to classify data. I think in in kind of a life cycle. So think about there's data out there that's unknown, either because again maybe the science hasn't gotten there yet. We're not we're not measuring it yet. We don't have devices to measure, whatever. That's the unknown world of, of you know, kind of future data. Then we have an exploratory realm uh, and that's data that we are starting to capture, starting to bring in, um, but we really don't know a lot about it yet. We don't know the ins and outs of that data. We don't know what's correct. You know, are we getting a correct set of data to, to reflect whatever that might be? or not, we don't know what the right sets of values are, things like that. So that exploratory mode uh, is, is kind of forward looking, kind of bleeding edge. Uh, and and that's, uh, that data is not structured yet. We, we can't really apply business logic. We're really, re it's more of a research um, and an exploration function. Then we, we move down to data that we do have some experience with, uh, that we are, we have a greater understanding of, we've got people in the organization who can help us understand that data, the ins and outs, uh, the definitions, things like that. Um, at that layer, we're, we're starting to understand and coalesce around uh, really uh, being able to, you know, create calculations off of that data and tell people definitively, you know, what it is. Right. And then down at the bottom level, the base level is kind of the traditional data warehouse level. It's the, the integration of data, whatever the integration platform is, um, or said another way, it's, it's kind of your uh, business logic instantiation platform. I, I don't think that's probably going to be uh, a trademarked term anytime soon. It's a little cumbersome, but anyway, it's where you're taking business logic and you're actually applying it to data and then allowing people to, to utilize that. And that's done you know, traditionally in a data warehouse environment, but that's the data that, that now you've got a, a really good handle on. Um, you have data stewards who can help with validation, help with definition, and you're, you're building that into a structure then that allows you to kind of move on then to the next thing. You're kind of saying, okay, we've got this, we built some reports off of it, we think we're good there, and then we, we can move off of that and, and look at other things. Um, so it, figuring out where you are in that realm and not trying to have everything be in that bottom layer. Um, and a lot of that is a short-term decision, just prioritization. What can you take on? What can your team take on at a time? But some of it might be a long-term, you know, we're not gonna get to this anytime soon. So we have to be comfortable that it's in the exploratory realm. And that means that we've got to be, you know, a little bit hesitant around that data because it hasn't been quite defined yet, hasn't gotten down to that layer. And data governance, enterprise data governance looks at all of that um, and really, really spends most of its time on that definition layer, that low level of definition and trying to bring as much into that, um, but knowing that it, that it can't it can't take on everything. So that's, that's how you start to tame that, that data is really just taking a really honest look at what can we accomplish with the different kinds of data and not trying to jump too far ahead and overwhelm the process, which happens too often, unfortunately. Right. So, you, so it sounds like if I was to paraphrase, Kevin, you, what you're saying, and to take this analogy one step further, instead of trying to tame four lions simultaneously, what you're saying is, look, you deal with the two that you need to, the, the base level and then that one level above that. And the other two, you kind of leave for, for a little bit later, like when you, when you discover what the real use of it is for, when, when the standards become uh, more accepted or the methodologies around in, uh, interpreting that data become more refined, you don't, basically you don't have to worry about them right now. Uh, and, right. and you shouldn't try to, because otherwise you could just take forever or not go anywhere. Um, with any of the four uh, lions. Exactly. And that's what happens too often is you try to tame all those lions at once, you know, you're severely outnumbered and, <laughs> and you get eaten alive. So to keep working with your analogy, yeah, no, definitely. And then you might have to say that one lion is going to, it's going to run off and we may not see him ever again. We don't know, but we have to, we have to work on what we can work on and try not to overwhelm the whole process because then we get nowhere. 
I think what would be helpful, Kevin, well, can you give me an example of what you would consider exploratory data today? Like this kind of data that you're saying is, you know, maybe a little bit unstructured, a little bit undefined, not really sure how we can use it yet, but we should be aware of. Yeah. So I think a really good example is when you when uh, you get outside of the, the four walls of the hospital, you know, organizations are starting to delve a bit into uh, looking at how, uh, you know, community uh, sourced data mm. uh, may, be, may be helpful. Um, looking at, you know, trying to get into the social determinants of health, uh, even looking at things like weather patterns right. and economics and, and those things that are, that are really well outside of the control of your health system. From a health system perspective, there may be people, and there are, you know, outside who who spend a lot of time with weather data, right? <laughs> we know that there's the Weather Channel knows a lot about weather data, but inside our walls, that's it's mysterious to us at this point, and how it how it actually interacts with what we do, and if it does, is really an unknown at this mm. point. And so that's a that's a pretty basic example, but I think you know as we look at um, you know really complex scientific data. Uh, around, you know, blood diseases or just the, the bleeding edge of research. Those are things that for now we're going to leave to the scientists at the big universities. And as they start to bring that in, um, then we can start to understand that more and apply business logic in a way that's operationally and clinically helpful to my organization. So obviously we have all this data and now we're going to shrink our scope and say, okay, now we have the two lines that we're dealing with, you know, the, not the experimental exploratory stuff, um, but more the defined information. Why is it important in your mind that healthcare organizations invest today in managing that data? Well, as we indicated before, the problem is only growing, right? The, the, the trends show no sign of slowing down as far as volumes of data go. And, and, you know, it's, that's not a, um, it is something that's overwhelming and it's something, it, but it's, it's not a problem as much as it is, uh, you know, a whole lot of possibilities. So what we want to do is we want to start now and make sure that, that our, our base is really good and that we're blocking and tackling well with the data we've been using in healthcare for many years. You know, we have claims data, we have billing data, we have, you know, basic encounter and uh, a clinical data. We need to be doing really well with that because that will then allow us to be able to access uh, that other data and really do um, exceptional things in the future. So I think the longer that you wait to really invest in you know, data management, uh, and most organizations are investing in data management, but they're kind of, uh, it, it's hard to know where to focus and it, it, it can be all, kind of all over the place. So. So now is definitely the time to do it. And I, I would recommend, you know, when we when we see things like AI is exciting, right? It's everyone's talking about it. If you go to a conference, nobody goes to the boring data governance uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> they go to the AI presentation because it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to think that we could potentially predict uh, you know, uh, deterioration in the ICU and, and things like that, that we could really help um, take some of the burden off of the, the clinical team. But we can't get to AI, we can't get to predictive without really getting the base set. And, you know, I see this a lot in organizations that, that we consult with, they'll do projects in prediction, which is great. And I, I recommend doing that, do targeted projects um, around predicting readmissions or what have you, um, so that you can kind of understand what's all involved. But what happens is the base data is not there yet. It's not well governed. It's not trusted. So, you know, those data scientists are spending so much time cleansing the data mm -hmm. in order to, in order to create their algorithms that then when they want to go on to the next project, it's, it's not tenable because they'd have to, they have to go back with this whole new set of data, spend a whole bunch more time, you know, cleansing that now. And they're really starting over from scratch. So operationally, it doesn't, it doesn't really translate. And so we, we need to invest in, in the data infrastructure, in data governance, and in uh, the tools that, that support that so that we can get to those, those uh, 
bleeding edge places in the future. So Kevin, Kevin let's, let's get practical for a minute. Um, I always love to get practical in these kinds of discussions. Is there something that a hospital CIO who's listening to this or watching this, is there something they could do tomorrow that would start them on the road to better data governance and better data management? Um, other than, you know, connecting with uh, DTA healthcare solutions, of course, but is there anything that they can just do tomorrow to kind of set themselves up for, for more success down the road when it comes to data? Actually, purchasing our services is the only way they're going to be able to move forward. <laughs> of course. <laughs> right? No, I, I'm kidding. There's definitely things that, that they can do. And, you know, it's interesting that when we go and do an assessment, a business intelligence and data governance assessment and organization, what we do is we go and meet with people from across the organization, you know, department chairs, uh, nursing managers, people in finance, HR, uh, you know, quality, safety. And we interview those folks for sometimes just a half an hour to, hunt, to find out how well are you being served with data in this organization and, and how well is data, uh, are you able to leverage data to make decisions and understand what's going in your area? And we find so often that they can't do the basics still. In this day and age, you know, I, don't, I can't get basic volumes. I can't get a population of patients. I, I have no idea, you know, what's going on in my department from a data perspective. Right. So I think the best thing a CIO can do, honestly, is, is, is do your own assessment and just sit down with some folks and, and, and hear, hear what they have to say. Now, in fairness, you know, people tend to be more candid with a third party than, than you know, they're worried about like, oh, am I going to offend this person? But if, if you make it kind of a safe environment and you can, you can forge those relationships, just find out, are people getting the basics of what they need? And try to not think about, you know, as a CIO, you know, all of the, the issues and the problems and, well, they can't tell us what they need and we're not resource properly and try to like put those away and put your consultant hat on and, and just just find out what's what's going on with the organization and then from there i think uh you know pursuing to get started in data governance really the the number one place to start is with transparency okay so don't try to fix we're not trying to if you haven't done anything in this area yet the first thing to do is expose how things work <laughs> because the biggest problem is you know i go and run a report as a as a nurse manager and it doesn't look right to me but i don't know where do i go with that how do i find out like how are they calculating this or who are they including in this and excluding which patients are there which ones aren't and and normally you can't you can't see that and sure. most people can't accept maybe the report developer. So the first thing is to leverage tools to be able to expose that business logic and their tools, uh, data catalogs. Uh, we happen to have one of those um, that, that help expose those, that business logic and what exists in the organization. So what reports do we have? You know, people we work with relatively small organizations have thousands of reports sometimes. And sure. they don't even know, have I created this one before? I don't know. It's hard to find out. So, so make transparent to the organization uh, how things are calculated, what exists. And then from there, you can start to scope out, all right, so where are our issues? Where do we get started with, with cleaning up data? Um, where are our biggest problems? Um, and then move on from there. And then the last thing I would say is um, this effort really can't be budget neutral. Um, you can start budget neutral, but ultimately what we've found is if you try to make data governance an everybody thing, which it is, um, it becomes a nobody thing. So mm -hmm. you need to do, it needs to be a both hand. There needs to be somebody with, with some level of data governance facilitation in their, in their job title, or their job description, and then uh, they can help facilitate that uh, for the organization. I want to pick up on two things you just said there. First of all, um, your, your talk about transparency, I think, is, is fantastic. Um, I can only imagine that when you get involved with, a, with an organization that you discover uh, on, with your clients how many reports are redundant or like no one uses them. So you can cull half or more of the reports yeah. that exist in, in an organization. Is that, does that happen? Yeah, I mean, think about the burden of just carrying around, you know, throwing more stuff on your pack 
and never really going back and looking to see what, what did I throw in a year ago and, and do I still need that? And it just gets heavier and heavier. And that, that weight is a burden for the organization. You're doing an upgrade um, and you've got to go touch, you know, 3000 reports instead of the maybe, you know, 1500 you use. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing. When you, when you get to that first stage of transparency, you can, do a search and say, what hasn't been run in over a year and start to look at, do we really need to, to carry these things through? And, and the second thing I wanted to pick up on was your statement around, you know, it ha- there has, this is not budget neutral. This has to be something that you choose to invest in and you have to designate somebody to shepherd it or be, at least be the leader of it. Because as you say, if you make everyone responsible for it, which ultimately it is, but at this stage, nothing will get done because everyone will look right. to waiting for everyone else to do something about it. Right. So, so if I go back to, you know, if, if I was a CIO uh, and sitting in front of you and I, f- you know, likely what I feel is that I'm already investing in data and data governance. I already have reports and I already have a data warehouse. What would you say to me to convince me that that's not enough, that I really should be doing a little bit more and allocating a little bit more of my budget to managing my data better? It's a great question. Uh, and I think from a CIO standpoint, uh, they really are investing in data management. And I think that they are, uh, they're generally willing to invest um, in data governance. But one of the big problems that they face is that it can't be owned by the CIO. You know, it, it isn't just an IT function. So you know, it needs to be something that's that's owned by the organization and supported by the organization. And CIOs are often, you know, and rightfully so hesitant to take that on because they don't want to be the data czar that now is going to have to carry that and try to force that through the organization. So, you know, ideally, uh, ideally, the CIO isn't even funding the data governance facilitation that comes out of, you know, another bucket just just to kind of help indicate to the organization that this is not an IT thing. This is an IT thing, right? This is something they need to fix because, you know, I'm an IT person. I can look at a sheet of numbers and be like, hey, look, a sheet of numbers was created. It looks great. But if I hand that over to a finance person, they look at it and in two seconds say, this is all wrong. Like this is, these calculations are wrong. I can't, I can't know every, you know, every subject area, especially in healthcare with, with all the really complex, you know, clinical issues. So I think, uh, I think part of it is just that hesitance to invest in something that you don't know if the organization is, is going to support. So I think that's where, um, you know, if CIOs are hearing this, they're going to have to first, I think, get buy-in from the organization uh, and, and really work with folks to, to really buy into that this is, a, this is a, a group effort here. It's not just IT. And ideally, that facilitation um, comes out of a different bucket. And I think that, that really um, speaks a message to the organization that, about who owns this. One of, Kevin, one of the things I've struggled with for a while is, is explaining to, to, to people what it is they're going to get out of doing data governance or managing their data better. I mean, it, it's almost like saying I should exercise more and therefore you'll be healthier. I was like, well, what, you know, that's great. It sounds really good and I probably should be doing it, but what does healthier mean? Like what, what is, what am I going to be able to do tomorrow that I can't do today? Um, you know, so if you've told me, for example, Hey, Colin, if you exercise 30 minutes every day, you're going to be able to uh, run a marathon and win a thousand dollars you know, uh, in, in three months, or right. you're going to be able to keep up with your kids or, you know, then it's like, oh, okay, that's tangible. I can see how A leads to B. What is the B? What is the, what is the, what is data governance? What is managing your data? What will it allow you to do tomorrow that you can't do today that I could tell somebody? Yeah. And you've nailed the, the, really the primary reason that the data governance uh, founders in, in, in organizations, it's because it's not sexy, and there's there's not a direct line to an ROI. You know, there's definitely an ROI, but it's it, the line kind of uh, zigzags a bit. So if if your data is not solid, and we talked about this a little bit before, then every time you want to do a, a more advanced project of prediction or AI or machine learning, what have you, you're gonna have to go back. And you're going to have to spend a ton of time working through that data. So we are, we already talked about that. That's one of the 
the main benefits is just becoming able to do that on a more regular basis. Okay. Um, and then there's there's just tons of operational inefficiencies that happen that that tend to be there, there are things that that data people know very well. Whenever I mention this to a data analyst or, or anyone who works in data, they're like, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> metrics that that don't line up. So finance has a metric for readmission rate or length of stay and quality has one and performance improvement has one and they all show up to the same meeting and the numbers are very different. What ends up happening that people on the committees don't see is that now data analysts are spending hours trying to figure out why don't our definitions match. Mm -hmm. It's a huge effort to try to figure that out and then multiply that out over multiple metrics and data elements and just the re different reports, our clinical or our, uh, our decision support and finance, that system is showing us that this is our financial performance, but the data warehouse is showing it this way. That inconsistency of data is hugely inefficient and, and trust just plummets in organizations when those things happen. Right. And if you don't have trust in the data, People aren't going to be using data to make decisions and they're going to be making it up their gut. And so all of those things that we're trying to move to be being a data driven, data enabled organization, we can't do that if there isn't trust. So that's why really the ROI, it, it's, it, it's not going to be, you know, lower days in AR and it's not going to be a shorter length of stay. Those direct lines to ROI are always helpful for folks, but this is something that's much more foundational um, and much more, uh, it'll be a, a long-term effort, but it'll, it'll really allow your organization to um, really push forward in, in how, what you can do with data. Yeah, I can totally see someone being in a meeting and having two metrics presented and they're different and how that would erode trust instantaneously and go, okay. And then of course, what will happen? So you launch a committee to go investigate why the data is different. Right. That'll unpack a whole box of worms and, uh, you know, right. in terms of, uh, uh, can of worms, sorry, <laughs> you know, in terms of, you know, well, we should look at this data and how come this data is inconsistent. Yeah. Right? So doing that ahead of time, being proactive about it, just engenders that trust in the data so that you can make confident, you can be confident that you're making decisions using the right information. Yeah, this death spiral happens every day in healthcare organizations where stuff doesn't look right and there's just spiraling of trying to figure it out and people are frustrated and job satisfaction plummets and trust plummets. And it's just, it happens constantly. And it, it, it really is a data governance issue. You need to be able to, uh, to have uh, the tools that allow you to define these metrics in one place. And if they're slightly different definitions for a good reason, and there are good reasons to have different measures of length of stay, performance improvement, they want to reduce length of stay in, you know, minutes. They don't want a length of stay that finance uses, which is just the number of midnights, right? So it's legitimate that they have different metrics in that case. And so we need to make sure that that's really clear to everybody. The name is different. The definition is something I can just go right to from the report. Boom. I can see what the inclusions and exclusions are and who the owner is. And I can go talk to them if I have questions about it. That's the kind of transparency that really um, that really gets rid of this, you know, metric chaos and and the death spiral that happens as a result. Kevin, we're getting close to the end of our time here, uh, so I want to ask this: of all, we covered a lot of, of ground today. We talked about you know this, this uh, intangible ROI, but how you need to have good data and good data foundation in order to leverage some advanced technologies like AI and prediction. We talked about what a CIO can do tomorrow. Uh, we talked about transparency. What's the one thing that you would want a listener to take away from our conversation today? I would say just get started. Um, it's, it's a hard road and, and be ready for that. There's no quick solution. If a vendor, if I came in and told you that I have a tool that's going to just fix everything tomorrow and, and everything's going to match and you won't have to worry about data anymore. You should kick me out of your office right away. <laughs> um, and anyone else who does it and people aren't quite that blunt, but sometimes that's, that's the, the shiny object, right? It's, it's difficult work, but you need to get started somewhere and you need to, um, you need to come up with a plan for starting to chip away at it. You've got to, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time, 
And, and, and that's really hard because, you know, we talk about those meetings where, where people see that the data doesn't match. They want it fixed now. And those are often very powerful people in the organization. And that, that flows down to the, to the worker bees and they want to fix that fast. So they're looking for a, a quick solution. It's not quick, but if you don't get started on it and you don't have a, a, a plan with, with a, uh, a graduated uh, incline, um, building that up, you're going to be in much worse shape year by year. Kevin, final question. Where can people f- go to find out more information about DTA Healthcare Solutions? Yeah, I mean, that last sentence I had was really negative, I realized. So I don't want to end on that negative note. Okay. I didn't say, thanks, calls over. So uh, yeah, our website is is uh, dtahealthcare.solutions, our, our data catalog uh, that we, we've been working on for years uh, just for healthcare. It's focused on healthcare. Um, you can find that at uh, compendiumdatacatalog.com. And it really is, I, I do want to say that it is, it is possible. It's possible to get your arms around data governance and start to make progress. And you can do really, really good things. Awesome. Kevin, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for sharing all the great knowledge that you did today. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. This has been Colin Hung with Healthcare IT Today. Thanks for listening.